Even an experienced maintenance mechanic, after years of working in a plant and walking through it every day, can be amazed at how complex it really is. The plant piping, for example. Hundreds of miles of pipe carrying millions of pounds of fluids every hour. Fluids like steam, water, fuel, chemicals, refrigerants, and lubricants that are vital to plant operations. Because plants rely on fluids moving continuously, any interruption of flow can cause serious problems. This is why pumps are so important. Pumps are the heart of these piping systems, keeping fluids moving and delivering them where they're needed. Like other equipment, pumps perform best when kept in top running condition. And keeping every pump in top condition is the aim of your plant's pump maintenance program. Of course, some pumping jobs are more important than others. And when a job demands a pump that can maintain a required pressure and ensure that fluids are delivered where they're needed, then this is the type of pump we're talking about, a positive displacement pump. Because of their reliability, positive displacement pumps have earned a place among the most important equipment in industry. Consequently, proper maintenance of pumps like this is a high priority in plant maintenance programs. But like any maintenance, the maintenance of positive displacement pumps is only as good as the skills of the mechanics who work on them. So, as you learn about these pumps and how to care for them, remember that you're learning how to handle your responsibility for effective pump maintenance. Since we're going to talk about pumps in this unit, we'll begin by seeing what pumps do. Then we'll take a brief look at the two major types of pumps. Finally, we'll concentrate on positive displacement pumps, which are the topic of this unit. Okay, let's start with pumps in general. Pumps have one basic purpose, to move fluids. It's a pump's job to move various liquids and gases from one location to another, usually through piping. Now, moving a fluid from here to there might not seem a very difficult or complicated job. For example, a pump should have very little trouble moving fluid from one end of this pipe to the other end. The pump has to exert only enough force on the fluid to keep it moving. But it's quite a different story for a pump to move a fluid from here to way up there. In this case, the pump has to exert enough force or pressure on the fluid to lift it a long distance against gravity and the weight of the fluid already in the pipe. You can see then that pumps must be able to move fluids in many different situations. Some fluids have to be moved uphill, some downhill. In other cases, they have to be forced into moving parts. Some liquids are pumped at temperatures near boiling while others are pumped at temperatures below the freezing point of water. Each of these different pumping jobs requires a different type of pump. There are literally dozens of different pump designs, each suited for a particular application. But for the purposes of this unit, we're concerned only with two major categories. Positive displacement pumps, like this rotary screw type, and centrifugal pumps, like this single stage unit. As you can see in this drawing, inside the casing of a centrifugal pump is a circular part called an impeller. The impeller rotates with the shaft when the pump is turned on. As the impeller spins, water entering it at the center is slung outward by centrifugal force, 
Using centrifugal force to move fluids is how centrifugal pumps get their name. Positive displacement pumps, on the other hand, operate by a totally different principle. Instead of centrifugal force, they use a solid object, like a piston, gear, or screw, to push or positively displace the fluid. To give you an idea what we mean by positive displacement, let's take a look at one type of positive displacement pump, a reciprocating pump. What you see here is a piston-type positive displacement pump. Basically, it's made up of a cylinder, a piston, piston rings, a piston rod, and two valves, all inside a casing. Each complete movement of the piston along the length of the cylinder is called a stroke. On the first stroke, the piston moves back, creating a suction in the cylinder. This suction opens the suction valve and draws water into the cylinder. On the second stroke, the piston moves forward, putting pressure on the water. This pressure closes the suction valve and opens the discharge valve. As the piston continues forward, it forces the water out through the open discharge valve and into the discharge piping. Again, the piston moves back and creates a suction. This suction closes the discharge valve, opens the suction valve, and draws new water into the cylinder. When the piston moves forward, it again displaces, or takes the place of, the water in the cylinder forcing the fluid out through the open discharge valve. This displacement of fluid is what gives positive displacement pumps their name. They all move fluids by displacing them with a solid object, like a piston or a gear, and then draw in more fluid to begin the cycle all over again. Now that we have a general idea of how centrifugal pumps and positive displacement pumps work, we can point out a major difference between the two types. Let's say that while this centrifugal pump is running, the operator closes the discharge valve. What happens? Well, as the valve closes, less and less water leaves the pump. When the discharge valve is completely closed, there's no discharge at all. The impeller simply continues to rotate, circulating the water inside the casing. There are two things we can learn from this. One is that the discharge of a centrifugal pump can be throttled, that is, decreased or increased by adjusting the discharge valve. The second is that shutting the discharge valve under the proper conditions will not necessarily damage the pump. But. What happens if we close the discharge valve on a positive displacement pump while it's running? Remember that in a piston-type pump, the space between the piston and the cylinder wall is sealed by piston rings. As a result, fluid cannot slip around the piston. So, if the discharge valve is closed, the fluid has nowhere to go. When the piston begins its forward stroke, it exerts pressure on the fluid. When the pressure on the trapped fluid gets high enough, something's going to give. The pump motor might stall, the pump gaskets could fail, or the casing itself might rupture. To prevent severe damage like this, positive displacement pumps have a relief valve located near the discharge. When excess pressure builds up, this relief valve opens to bleed off the pressure. Unlike centrifugal pumps, then, positive displacement pumps cannot be throttled by adjusting the discharge valve, and their discharge valves cannot be shut without seriously affecting the pump. The fact that positive displacement pumps must discharge all their fluid on each discharge stroke might seem a disadvantage, but actually, there are two advantages in this feature. First, since the fluid being pumped must be completely discharged, we can be certain that unless the discharge is severely blocked, the fluid will be moved. 
This makes these pumps extremely reliable, suiting them for important jobs like supplying lubrication to turbine bearings. Secondly, because we know how much fluid the cylinder holds, and we know that the entire cylinder empties on each discharge stroke, it's easy to calculate the amount of fluid a piston pump moves in, say, an hour. All we do is multiply the amount of fluid the cylinder holds by the number of strokes in an hour. This feature makes positive displacement pumps ideal for applications such as chemical metering, where the amount of fluid pumped must be known and controlled. Okay, we know that the purpose of all pumps is to move fluids. We've also seen two of the most common types of pumps, centrifugal and positive displacement. Right after this short break, we'll look at a few different types of positive displacement pumps. As you'll see, there are many different ways to move a fluid. In discussing positive displacement pumps, the only type we've seen so far is the piston type. As you remember, the typical piston pump consists of a piston and cylinder and discharge and suction valves all housed in a casing. In addition, there are ports to direct the suction and the discharge flow. And to eliminate leakage, the space between the piston and the cylinder wall is sealed by piston rings. A second type of reciprocating positive displacement pump is the plunger type. Both plunger and piston pumps are essentially the same. The major difference between them is that in a plunger pump, the piston and piston rod are replaced by a plunger. The plunger is sealed differently from the way a piston is sealed. While piston pumps have piston rings, plunger pumps are sealed by packing that can be inspected and replaced without having to completely disassemble the pump. Closely related to the piston type and plunger type pumps is the diaphragm pump. Diaphragm pumps get their name from a flexible part called a diaphragm which they use to displace fluids. As you can see, the diaphragm stretches across the pump cavity, sealing the lower area from the upper one. In this pump, a connecting rod is attached to the diaphragm and is driven by an eccentric. The suction and discharge valves are on the side of the diaphragm opposite the connecting rod and eccentric. The suction stroke begins with the eccentric in its lowest position and the diaphragm extended against the wall of the lower cavity. As the eccentric rotates, it pulls the diaphragm upward. This upward motion creates a suction below the diaphragm, opening the suction valve and drawing fluid into the cavity. As the eccentric rotates, forcing the connecting rod downward, the diaphragm exerts pressure on the fluid. This pressure opens the discharge valve, closes the suction valve, and displaces the fluid out of the pump. One big advantage of diaphragm pumps is that the diaphragm completely seals one half of the pump cavity from the other. As long as the diaphragm is intact, there's no leakage, and the capacity of the pump is the same on every stroke. For this reason, Diaphragm pumps are often used as chemical metering pumps. Using a simple diaphragm pump for metering chemicals has one serious drawback. Its capacity can't be adjusted to pump different amounts for different applications. In true chemical metering pumps, then the diaphragm is controlled by some type of adjustment device. These adjustment devices come in a variety of specialized designs. In the metering pump you see here, the adjustment device is actually a plunger pump directly connected to the diaphragm pump. An eccentric and connecting rod drive the plunger and in turn, 
the discharge of the plunger pump drives the diaphragm pump. To understand how this plunger diaphragm metering pump operates, let's first look at the plunger side of the pump. Basically, this half of the pump consists of an oil reservoir formed by the casing, a cylinder with an opening at either end, a plunger that moves up and down inside the cylinder, driven by a connecting rod and an eccentric, and a metering arm. This metering arm extends down into the cylinder through a hole in the top of the plunger. There are two things you should notice about this metering arm. First, by turning the adjustment knob at the top, the arm can be moved up or down. Second, the lower section of this arm has been hollowed out, giving the fluid in the cylinder a channel to flow through. The plunger is sealed along its inside diameter and its outside diameter to prevent fluid from leaking past it at any other point than through the channel in the arm. The plunger is also sealed at the bottom to prevent leakage out of the cylinder. When the pump is turned on, the eccentric and connecting rod lift the plunger. As the plunger exerts pressure on the fluid, some of the fluid above the plunger escapes through the channel in the arm into the lower part of the cylinder. But when the top of the plunger rises above the channel, fluid can no longer escape through the arm. Instead, the trapped fluid is forced out through the opening that leads to the diaphragm. This fluid enters the cavity on one side of the diaphragm, forcing the diaphragm to bulge outward. The bulging diaphragm pushes fluid out the discharge. On its second stroke, the plunger moves downward in the cylinder. This draws the fluid out of the diaphragm cavity, causing the diaphragm to draw in more fluid from its own suction piping. When the plunger falls below the opening in the metering arm, fluid from the reservoir and the lower half of the cylinder can flow up into the top of the cylinder. This equalizes the pressure above and below the plunger. Remember that the purpose of a metering pump is to discharge fluid in carefully measured amounts. To regulate the amount of fluid the diaphragm discharges on each stroke, we must regulate the amount of fluid the plunger uses to move the diaphragm. This is done by adjusting the knob on the metering arm. Lowering the arm moves the channel opening deeper into the cylinder. As a result, when the plunger passes the opening, more fluid is trapped in the top of the cylinder and the diaphragm moves further than it did when the arm was set higher. As we raise the arm, a much smaller amount of fluid gets trapped by the plunger. The less fluid used to move the diaphragm, the less the diaphragm moves. So, with the arm adjusted upward, the diaphragm discharges only a small percentage of its capacity on each discharge stroke. For this reason, metering pumps can be adjusted to pump exactly the right amount of fluid for any given application. What we've seen is only one metering pump design. There are many other ways to meter fluids. But having seen how one type works, you'll find that the other types of metering pumps aren't difficult to understand. So far then, we've looked at the basic types of reciprocating pumps. The piston type, the plunger type, and the diaphragm type. And we've seen one way in which a plunger pump and a diaphragm pump can be combined for special applications, such as metering chemicals. Now we turn to the second type of positive displacement pump, the rotary pump. As we saw, reciprocating pumps move fluids through some type of back and forth motion. Rotary pumps, as their name implies, displace fluids with rotating parts, like gears or screws. This drawing shows a typical gear type rotary pump. The gears are arranged so that as they rotate, their teeth mesh perfectly. In addition, the spaces between the tip of the gear teeth 
and the casing are extremely small, preventing fluid from leaking around the teeth. Usually, only one of the gears is attached to a motor or other prime mover. This first gear drives the second one. When the pump is turned on, the gears rotate, picking up fluid in the spaces between their teeth on the suction side. As the teeth rotate, the fluid moves along in the spaces between the teeth and the casing. When the teeth reach the discharge side and mesh, the fluid is squeezed out from between them. The constant delivery of fluid from the suction to the discharge builds discharge pressure, which forces the fluid out of the pump. A second type of rotary pump is the lobe pump. A lobe pump has lobes in place of gears. Lobe pumps move fluids in much the same way that gear pumps do. But because lobes cannot mesh like gears can, one lobe cannot drive the other. So all true lobe pumps require timing gears to coordinate the rotation of the lobes. A third common type of rotary positive displacement pump is the screw type. Instead of a gear or lobes, screw types have one or more rotary screws, like this one. Two parts of the screw that you should know about are the lands, which are the raised parts of the screw, and the flights, the spaces between the lands. As you can see in this drawing of a screw pump, the screw fits snugly inside the bore of the casing. The clearance between the land and the wall of the casing is within thousandths of an inch. When the pump is turned on, fluid enters through the suction port and gets trapped in the screw flights. As the rotor turns, the flights move toward the discharge end of the pump, carrying the fluid with them. When the fluid reaches the discharge port, the pressure exerted by the screw is enough to force the fluid out through the discharge piping. Because screw pumps are very common in almost all industrial situations, we'll be concentrating on them through the remainder of this unit. In the next segment, we'll see two different types of screw pumps, their parts, and functions. For now, though, it's important for you to be able to identify the two basic types of positive displacement pumps, reciprocating pumps and rotary pumps, and describe how each type operates. In addition to the pumps we've seen so far, your text shows several other types of positive displacement pumps. To give you an opportunity to review this material with your instructor, let's pause for a short break. When we talked about positive displacement pumps in the last segment, we mentioned two types, reciprocating pumps that have pistons, plunges, or diaphragms, and rotary pumps that use gears, lobes, or screws. In this unit, we'll concentrate on rotary screw-type pumps, because you'll often find yourself having to work on this type of pump. Rotary screw-type pumps, or simply screw pumps, can be divided into two categories those that do use timing gears and those that don't use timing gears. But whether or not a screw pump uses timing gears, they all have one or more screw type rotors like this. Most often, a screw type pump has two or three of these rotors. As a starting point for our discussion, let's look at a screw type pump that does not have timing gears. This is a three screw rotary pump which means that inside it are three rotors. Only one of the three, the power rotor, extends out of the pump and connects to a motor or other prime mover. Notice that on this pump, the suction port is located at one end of the casing, while the discharge port is located at the other. This arrangement poses a particular problem that we'll talk about in a few moments. If we open this pump up, we'd see basically what's shown in this drawing. Here, of course, is the power rotor, 
It meshes directly with the other two rotors, called idlers. When the power rotor turns, it drives the two idlers. The one disadvantage here is that because the three rotors are in constant physical contact, the rotors wear at the points where they mesh together. In addition to the way the screws are driven, there are two other important characteristics of the three rotors. First, they're enclosed in a rotor housing, which is a sleeve that fits inside the pump casing. And second, the tolerances between the rotors and between the lands and the rotor housing are very small. This prevents leakage from the discharge back to the suction. But there is one place where fluid can still leak out of the pump, and that's where the shaft penetrates the casing at the discharge end. To prevent fluid from leaking out along the shaft, the pump is equipped with a mechanical seal. Every mechanical seal has both rotating parts that turn with the shaft and screws, and stationary parts. Since friction between the rotating parts and the stationary parts of the seal can cause excessive heat buildup, the seals must somehow be kept cool. That's the job of the seal return line. The seal return line carries fluid that leaks into the seal cavity back to the suction of the pump. This constant flow of fluid through the seal cavity helps to keep the seal cool. Now, to see how a three-screw pump moves fluid, let's look at this simplified drawing. Because the three rotors are arranged in line, only one of the rotors can be seen here. When the pump is turned on, the motor turns the power rotor, which in turn drives the idlers. Fluid, in this case oil, enters through the suction port and becomes trapped in the spaces between the lands of the rotor and the rotor housing. As the screws turn, the oil moves along with them until it reaches the discharge port. The force exerted by the screws builds up enough pressure in the discharge to force the fluid out of the pump and into the discharge piping. Obviously, the pressure is much higher at the discharge end of the pump than it is at the suction end. As a result, the higher discharge pressure constantly exerts force or thrust across the screws in this direction. The force exerted in this direction puts a strain on the mechanical seal and on the bearings that support the power rotor. With the suction port at one end and the discharge port at the other, the problem is how to balance the discharge and the suction thrusts to relieve the strain on the bearings and other parts. In this pump, the problem has been solved through use of a balancing device. The piston you see here is a balance piston. It's enclosed in a balance piston housing. The balance piston works in conjunction with two other pump parts. The oil balance tubes, which are passages drilled through the entire length of the rotor housing, and the thrust cage. Let's see how these four components work together against thrust from the discharge. To begin, let's determine the effects of the discharge pressure on the pump. This pressure acts on three important areas. First, it pushes directly on the lands of the rotors in the direction shown. Second, it forces oil through the oil balance tubes to the thrust cage. In the thrust cage, the oil both lubricates the idlers and pushes against the idlers and the power rotor. The force it exerts helps to counter the force exerted by the oil in the discharge. Third, the discharge pressure exerts force on the balance piston and on the piston housing. Although the piston housing is fixed, the balance piston is free to move. And since the balance piston is directly attached to the power rotor, any pressure exerted on the piston is transmitted to the rotor. The overall effect is that equal force is exerted on the rotors from both ends of the pump. Because these forces are equal, but in the opposite direction from one another, they cancel each other out. As a result, the rotors are held in proper position while the pump is operating. Okay.
We've seen how a screw pump without timing gears works, and we saw one method for balancing thrust on the screws. We're now going to look at a two screw pump that does have timing gears and that uses a different method for balancing thrust. Here, of course, are the two screws. Unlike the screws in the other pump, these don't actually touch. They don't have to, because the power rotor, the longer one, doesn't drive the idler by direct contact. Nonetheless, the space between the lands of one screw and the lands of the other are very small, thousandths of an inch at most. Because these spaces are so small, they prevent almost all leakage from the discharge to the suction. The timing gears that transmit power from one screw to the other are helical gears located in a gear housing at the outboard end of the pump. Notice also that this pump has no rotor housing inside the casing. Instead, the casing itself forms the bore where the rotors fit. At either end of the screws are bearing brackets, housing the bearings that support the rotors. This is the front, or inboard, bearing bracket, and this is the rear, or outboard, bearing bracket. Another difference between this pump and the three-rotor pump that we saw before is the arrangement of the screws and the suction and discharge ports. On both rotors of these, the lands and screw flights angled inward from the ends. And both the suction port and the discharge port are in the center of the casing. To understand the advantages of this design, Let's look at what happens when the pump is turned on. The first rotor, connected to its motor or other prime mover, begins to rotate. As the gear on the power rotor turns, it drives the gear attached to the second rotor. As a result, the second rotor rotates also, without having to touch the first rotor at all. This saves wear and tear on both rotors by eliminating any friction or stress between them. All wear takes place between the timing gears. That tells us how power is transmitted from the motor to both screws. But what path does the oil follow through this pump? As we can see in this simplified side view, oil enters through the suction port at the bottom center of the casing. From there, it's directed toward both ends of the pump. At either end, the oil becomes trapped between the casing and the lands of the screws. As the screws turn, the oil is moved from both ends toward the middle. When the oil reaches the middle, it's forced out through the discharge port and into the discharge piping. The advantage of this arrangement is that there's no need for any balancing device. Because the suction pressure exerts equal force at both ends, and because the discharge exerts equal force outward in both directions, the system is already balanced. That pretty well covers this two-screw pump. It uses timing gears to transmit power from one rotor to the other. And the arrangement of the screws and the suction and discharge ports balances the system when it's operating. Because its design is so common, we'll be using this pump to demonstrate various maintenance procedures, including a pump overhaul. But right now, let's take a short break to give you a chance to review the material in your text. We've seen many of the parts of a positive displacement pump, but we've only barely mentioned one very important part of every pump, the sealing system that prevents fluid from leaking out of the casing along the shaft. Without some type of seal, leakage along the shaft would be uncontrolled, a lot of oil would be wasted, and the discharge pressure of the pump would drop considerably. In pumps, the problem of sealing against leakage is a complicated one. This is because what you have is a rotating part, the shaft, surrounded by a stationary part, the casing. 
If you put a stationary rubber seal in the space between them, the friction between the seal and the shaft would heat the seal and wear it down in no time. If you attached the seal ring to the shaft so that it rotated when the shaft rotated, the seal would constantly rub against the casing and the results would be the same. Basically then, the problem with sealing a space between a rotating part and a stationary part is friction. Friction creates drag on the rotor and causes damaging heat buildups that can score the shaft and the casing. In the war against friction, designers have developed two approaches. One is to fill the stuffing box with soft, lubricated packing material. Packing is relatively inexpensive and can be replaced without taking the pump apart. The other approach is to use a mechanical seal, like the one on this pump. Although more expensive and more difficult to replace than packing, mechanical seals are being used more and more. We'll see why in a moment. Since many of the rotary pumps you'll be working on have mechanical seals instead of packing, let's take a close look at how mechanical seals are designed and how they work. There are many different types of mechanical seals, but we'll discuss only the type used in this pump. Other types of seals are discussed in detail in another unit. The parts of the mechanical seal that you see disassembled here can be divided into two categories, stationary parts that attach to the casing and rotating parts that attach to the shaft and rotate along with it. The first stationary part is the seal plate, which attaches to the end of the casing. The seal plate fits around the shaft and holds the other parts in place. The two other stationary parts are the stationary face and the rubber O-ring that fits in the groove around the edge of the stationary face. The stationary face and the O-ring fit inside the seal plate. The O-ring forms a tight seal between the two metal parts, while the hard, polished surface of the stationary face provides a smooth, low-friction surface for the rotating parts to ride against. The rotating parts include a collar, which is attached to the shaft by set screws, and the cartridge, which is permanently attached to the collar. Inside the cartridge is a spring mechanism that exerts pressure against the rotating parts, and the carbon seal, which fits against the spring mechanism. Now, there's a space in the back of the carbon ring where an O-ring fits. The O-ring is bigger than the inside ring and has to be forced in there. The O-ring rides between the carbon seal and the spring mechanism. All of these parts fit inside a specially designed opening in the casing. The opening that the seal fits in is much like a stuffing box in a pump that uses packing. This cutaway drawing shows all the parts of the mechanical seal in their proper operating position inside the pump casing. Starting from the inside end of the stuffing box is the collar, attached to the shaft by set screws. Then, the cartridge with its spring mechanism. Next come the O-ring and a carbon seal ring. Right up against the carbon seal ring is the stationary face, with another O-ring around its outside edge. The seal plate at the end of the stuffing box holds the stationary face in position. Between the seal plate and the casing is a gasket. Pressure exerted by the spring mechanism holds the carbon face tightly against the stationary face. When the pump is turned on, the relatively soft carbon sealing ring rides against the polished metal sealing surface. The smoothness of these two surfaces and the thin film of fluid between them reduces friction to a minimum. Okay, 
That tells us about the parts of the mechanical seal. But how do these parts seal the fluid inside the casing? When the pump is turned on, the pressure inside the casing forces some fluid along the shaft. This fluid leaks past the collar and through the cartridge, but the O-ring that seals the carbon face and the shaft prevents it from leaking any farther. Still, some fluid will leak around the outside of the carbon seal. This leakage is blocked by three seals. The seal between the carbon and the stationary face, the O-ring that seals the stationary face and the end plate, and the gasket between the seal plate and the pump casing. In effect, then, leakage is stopped at four points, and the fluid is contained in the pump. If fluid remains stationary in the seal chamber, the friction between the fluid and the rotating parts could cause the seal to get very hot. For this reason, there is a seal return line from the seal chamber back to the suction of the pump. When the pump is operating, fluid flows through the seal and back to the suction, cooling the seal parts. When you install mechanical seals, you must be sure that the collar is placed in the right position on the shaft. This is necessary in order to compress the spring correctly and obtain the proper tension between the stationary and rotating seal faces. In this mechanical seal, there is a load line to help you do this. When the seal is installed, the spring plate lines up with the load line, like this. Other seals will require similar adjustment, but not all seals have a load line like this one. You'll have to consult the manufacturer's instruction manual for specific instructions on any seal you work on. Another thing you should be aware of when installing a, a mechanical seal is how fragile the surfaces of the carbon ring and the stationary face are. Because these two surfaces are precisely machined to ride against each other with as little friction as possible, it's very important to protect them from anything that might mar their surfaces. This means protecting them not only from contact with sharp or rough surfaces, but also from contact with your fingers. Even the mild acid of your fingertips can etch marks into them. Never touch these surfaces with your hands. If you do accidentally get something on the sealing surfaces, wipe the seal immediately with a soft cloth. This brief discussion of mechanical seals will be useful to you when you overhaul a rotary positive displacement pump in the next unit. But there's still a question that we haven't answered. Why use mechanical seals when packing material is less expensive and easier to replace? Well, the fact is that mechanical seals are more reliable. Packing is much more likely to develop lubrication problems that could build up friction against the shaft. If the resulting heat gets high enough, the shaft can be scorched and ridges can be cut into it by the packing. And even though packing is less expensive and far easier to replace than a mechanical seal, mechanical seals last for years, while packing may last less than a month. This means that in the long run, mechanical seals require less maintenance. You can turn off the tape now and review the material we've covered in this segment. Like all other types of equipment, positive displacement pumps develop problems. They lose sufficient lubrication, their shafts become misaligned, and of course, they're subject to normal wear and mechanical damage. Some problems, like leaky seals, are easy to spot. Others can only be detected by an experienced eye or a trained sense of hearing and touch. As you gain experience in pump maintenance, you'll learn how to read a pump almost at a glance. You'll learn what a pump should sound like and how much vibration or heat is normal. Once you know how a pump is supposed to act, detecting problems will be a lot easier. There's really nothing you can substitute for experience, but there are maintenance guidelines and procedures to follow, and that's what we'll be looking at in this segment. 
In most cases, you'll find out that there's some problem with a particular pump when the pump operator contacts the maintenance foreman. Maintenance? Yeah, it does? Yeah, this is Norris. Look, that uh, number one main fuel oil pump. Yeah, the one with the leaking mechanical seal. Yeah, well, somebody better come on out here and check this thing out. She's growling pretty good on the outboard end. Yeah, okay, I'll meet him out here. All right. What do you say, Norris? Hey, Doug. Got some problems more than the mechanical seals, huh? Yeah, the outboard end is growling. Is you can right? see the mechanical seals leaking, but... You hot? Yeah, it's pretty warm. Yeah, well, I think we got a timing gear problem, a bearing problem. More than likely timing gear. And we're definitely going to have to get into that mechanical seal. All right now, Norris, this thing's running pretty warm. I want you to stick around here and keep an eye on it. I'll get one of my maintenance people out here as quick as I can to take a look at it. The guy that's going to be working on it, I'd like for him to hear it running so he has a little more insight into what he's doing when he tears into it, what he's looking for. I'll have him out here two or three minutes at the most. Can you stick around for a few Okay, minutes? yeah, I'll be here. Okay, now if something goes wrong with it, don't hesitate on taking it out of service, but... Uh, okay. Okay. Talking to the pump operator is an important part of good troubleshooting technique. Remember that the operator lives with the pump during his entire shift. He can tell you what is normal and what is abnormal for the unit, making your investigation a lot easier. In this case, we already know that the mechanical seal and either the outboard bearing or the timing gears are worn or damaged. But if you're not sure what the problem is, there are several things you should ask the operator. First, when did the problem begin? If it occurred suddenly, the problem could be the complete failure of a part. If the problem developed over a period of weeks or even months, however, it's probably the result of gradual wear. Second, find out about any changes in pump status. Has the discharge pressure or suction pressure changed? Are there any unusual noises or signs of leakage? When the operator has filled you in, you're ready to make your own inspection of the pump. The mechanic already knows that a loud growling sound has developed on the outboard end of this pump. So he begins by using a sounding rod to listen to both the timing gears and the bearings. In this way, he can pinpoint the source of the noise and take some of the guesswork out of his troubleshooting. He also checks the temperature of the gearbox to confirm that the temperature is higher than it should be. Since mechanical seal problems have also been reported, he checks the seal carefully to be sure it needs replacement and not merely adjustment. When the mechanic has looked the pump over and determined what action he needs to take, the operator can arrange to have the pump shut down and tagged out. Of course, in this case, the mechanic had a good idea of what problems he was troubleshooting. That greatly simplified his inspection. But many times you won't know what's wrong with the pump. When this happens, you'll have to inspect the pump thoroughly for any symptoms that might indicate what the problem is. The symptoms you have to check for can be divided into two categories. Those you can hear, feel, or see while the pump is running, and those you can only detect when the pump is torn down. In the first category, symptoms you can hear, feel, or see are unusual noises. A loud rattling or clanging noise could result from a broken part or foreign object loose inside the casing. And as we saw before, bad bearings and damaged timing gears often produce a loud howling or grinding noise. Usually though, loud noises, especially violent chattering noises, are caused by one of three things. First, there could be a loss of suction. 
resulting in not enough fluid flowing into the pump. Second, there might be air or some other gas trapped in the pump. Or finally, the pressure relief valve might be set too low. The first problem, loss of suction, can be the result of a partially closed suction valve or a blockage in the suction piping. The suction strainer might be clogged, blocking the flow of oil. On the other hand, if it's very cold outside and the oil being pumped is not preheated, it could become too thick to flow. Remember, oil is like molasses. The colder it gets, the thicker and slower it becomes. Whether the problem is a blocked suction line or the oil becoming too thick to flow, the result is the same. The suction is starved and the rotors have no fluid to pump. Instead of drawing oil, the pump draws a vacuum. Without oil, the rotors spin loosely and the timing gears and rotors rattle against each other. The same noise results if air enters the pump. Air usually enters the pump when a leak develops somewhere in the system. In this case, a leak has developed at one of the mechanical seals. Once air is drawn into the pump, the vacuum inside is interrupted and the pump becomes air-bound. Without the resistance of the oil, the rotors spin loosely and the screws and timing gears rattle loudly against each other. The other loud noise we mentioned is the sound resulting from the relief valve being set too low. Relief valves are designed to bleed off excess pressure from the discharge. To do this, they must be set to lift when the pressure rises a certain percentage above the normal discharge pressure for the unit. When a relief valve is set too low, that is too near the normal discharge pressure of the pump, the valve will be constantly opening and closing in rapid succession. The result is a chattering that is somewhat different from the sound of a starved or air-bound pump. That covers three of the most common causes of loud noise. Insufficient flow of oil, air entering the pump, and too low a setting on the relief valve. In addition, there are two noises caused by problems with the discharge. The first is a grinding or growling sound that could indicate that the discharge is partially blocked and the oil is having trouble leaving the pump. If you hear a growling noise, check to be sure that the discharge valve is open all the way. Otherwise, the problem is probably an obstruction in the piping. The second sound you might hear when the discharge is blocked is a high squeal of the relief valve lifting to relieve the pressure buildup. If you hear any of the sounds we've described, or any other unusual noise, it's helpful to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. You can use a sounding rod, as we saw before, or a stethoscope, like the one being used here. In either case, keep the instrument, your hands, and your clothing clear of all rotating parts. So far, we've discussed only those symptoms that you can hear when the pump is running. Now, what about symptoms you can feel? Well, one thing you can feel is excessive vibration. If you know what normal pump vibration feels like, it's easy to detect excessive vibration using your hand. A more accurate method is to use an instrument like the one you see here, a vibrometer. A vibrometer gives an accurate vibration reading that can easily be compared to the readings from other pumps. Vibration of the casing is usually a sign of problems inside the pump. Vibration of the shaft, on the other hand, is caused by the shafts being misaligned or one shaft being bent or out of round. If you find that a pump or shaft is really vibrating badly, have the pump stopped until you can find the cause. Another symptom you can feel on an operating pump is overheating. Overheating occurs most often at the bearings and at the seals or the stuffing box. As we saw before, you can detect overheating problems with your hand. 
If a bearing or sealing system is hot to the touch, it's probably too hot. But again, there's an instrument that will give you a much more accurate temperature reading. This device is a pyrometer. By holding the heat-sensitive probe against the bearing housing or the stuffing box, you'll get a temperature reading on the meter. The symptoms you can feel on an operating pump then are excessive vibration and overheating of the bearings and the sealing system. Since we've already covered symptoms we can hear, the only symptoms left to talk about are those we can see. One of the best indicators of problems inside the pump is the reading on the discharge pressure gauge. If the reading is abnormally low, you can be sure that something has gone wrong, either with the pump or with the gauge itself. An abnormally high discharge pressure reading can indicate a problem too, usually a partially clogged discharge. In both cases, the gauge should be checked by the instrument shop. If it checks out all right, you can be certain something is wrong with the pump or piping. For example, a gradual drop in discharge pressure usually means excessive wear on one or more of the parts. A sudden drop, on the other hand, could indicate any of several things. Maybe something is clogging the suction piping, or there could be a leak in the casing or the discharge piping. And of course, there's the possibility that the suction valve is not open all the way, or the oil is too thick to flow properly. Finally, low discharge pressure could result from a loss of suction. Check to be sure that the fluid supply has not run out. If there is a fluid at the suction port, a positive displacement pump is usually able to draw it into the casing. That is, most positive displacement pumps are self-priming. Still, it's recommended practice to flood the casing with fluid before turning the unit on. This is important because positive displacement pumps, like this one, are lubricated by the fluid they pump, usually oil. Priming puts the lubricant where it's needed and prevents the rotating parts from being damaged by lack of lubrication. In many cases, priming a positive displacement pump can be a very simple procedure. It's usually done by opening the vent on the pump casing or piping, allowing the air to leak out and allowing fluid to fill the casing. The vent is closed when the fluid coming out is free of bubbles. This should be done each time the pump is overhauled and any time the pump has lost suction. One of the most common causes of a low discharge pressure reading is worn parts. When the idlers or the rotor housings wear, the distance between these parts increases. As the gap increases, the leakage increases, and fluid can move from the discharge back to the suction. As a result, both discharge pressure and discharge capacity usually decrease together. Of course, any drop in discharge pressure can be read right off the discharge pressure gauge. But a decrease in capacity is not so easy to spot unless the pump is equipped with a flow gauge. If there's no flow gauge on the pump you're working on, you can detect a change in capacity by using one of the methods described in your text. Besides changes in discharge pressure readings, Another symptom you can see is leakage. Inspect the pump and its piping very carefully. Look for puddles of liquid or drips that will show you where the leak is. Understand, though, that in some cases, leakage is normal and necessary. Most packing glands, for example, require a certain amount of leak off for lubrication. Before you're able to tell whether the amount of leak off from a packing gland is normal or not, you'll have to observe dozens of pumps to develop a feel for what is proper. This pump has no packing. Instead, it has mechanical seals, which require no leak off. So if you spot a leaky mechanical seal, you'll know this is a problem that needs correction. Another symptom you can see when the pump is running is lubrication leaking from the bearing housings.
Leaking grease or lube oil can be an indication of serious problems. So be on the lookout for lubrication leaks and make every effort to locate the leak and properly correct it. We've divided the symptoms into those you can hear, those you can feel, and those you can see. But most often, you'll find that problems cause more than one symptom to appear. For example, worn bearings will not only be noisy, but will probably also be overheated. Broken parts inside the casing may show up both as loud rattling noises and a drop in discharge pressure. Regardless of what symptoms you find, they are only symptoms. To get to the root of the problem, you'll probably have to open up the pump and inspect the parts. Now that we've seen some of the basics of troubleshooting a positive displacement pump, you should have a pretty good feel for the types of symptoms you might find and what those symptoms indicate. In the next unit, we'll overhaul the screw pump that the operator reported earlier. If the maintenance mechanics inspection was correct, we'll find that the timing gears and that the two inboard mechanical seals need to be replaced. But before going on to the overhaul, turn off this tape and review the material we've covered in this unit.